Senior, thank you all for being a part of your uh, White Nights meeting. If you can advance the slide, please. I have no disclosures. Ah, there it is. Thank you. So progress has been made in rectal cancer in all these areas. And I think the most important progress has been made uh, through surgical technique. I think next comes imaging. And, and as, as I just heard, a screening has begun in the Netherlands a couple of years ago. And that is, and I'm happy to see that it's going to take off in Russia. And that is really going to change because you will see a lot more small tumors. And that will change it. So with with TME surgery, with good radiotherapy, we have improved the oncological outcome. Um, we have decreased the recurrence rate to below 5%. In the Netherlands, the survival has gone up to 65%. But still, there are some, there's a price to be paid. There is post-op morbidity and mortality, especially in the elderly. And of course, there's functional problems. Some people end up with a stoma or with a very low anastomosis that doesn't always work very well. So we have to think, okay, we've made progress with oncological outcome, but can we make progress with functional outcome too? And we have been doing so for very early lesions, adenomas, and very, very early rectal cancer. We have developed local excision techniques that of course have a better functional outcome. And that works in, this, in the very small tumors. This is a large series of a UK consortium. And if you have a small PT1 tumor that doesn't grow deeply into the bowel wall, that has no lymphatic invasion, then the recurrence rates are low. But as soon as you have a deeper growing tumor with adverse features, you have 15 to 20% or more of residual disease, and, and that is not acceptable. So one of the things that can happen is you, you think you have a very small lesion, you excise it locally, and it turns out to be a T2 or an LVI plus. And our standard guideline is you should do completion TME, but in a distal tumor, that could mean a rectal amputation. But it still is the best oncological control but do we have alternatives? Could we just follow them with MRI? Could we give adjuvant chemo radiation after the local excision? Maybe. And we are running a trial that compares completion TME versus chemo radiation in this small group of patients who will become more important if you start screening. The second thing you can do for small tumors is, is start with neoadjuvant chemo radiation and then do a local excision. And at the bottom I have listed a number of prospective trials. So the surgeons have been doing this for quite some while. These are usually T1, T2, early T3 and zero tumors. And what you see in this series that that you can achieve organ preservation in roughly half of these patients. In many of them the chemo radiation has killed the tumor already. Uh, the functional outcome is probably better than if you do a TME, but if you do chemo radiation and a local excision, some of these patients have some trouble too. So this works well for small tumors. If you have a good response, the problem is these other half of patients who do not have a good response, they still require major surgery. And they had chemo radiation and then major surgery, so their function will be worse. And they could have been better off with surgery only. So this is another group of patients that is becoming increasingly important. And for this group of patients, we are running a trial together with UK and Denmark. T1, T3, N0 relatively small tumors, and we randomized between straight radical surgery, no radiotherapy, versus organ preservation by either short or long course. So you give the radiotherapy and then you assess. If it doesn't respond very well, you still do surgery. 
and we are curious to find out. We think the oncological outcome in the three arms is going to be similar, but we are wondering which one is going to be functionally the, the best. Then there's this other group of patients that we had been seeing. I'm sure that, that you'll see, you are seeing too. These are the advanced tumors where you give chemo radiation and you sometimes see dramatic responses. And you know in your resection specimens that 15% has a complete response. And you can wonder, well, should I have been operating this patient? So in addition to the small tumors where you have a different problem, where you have to decide from the onset, what should I do? Should I go for chemo radiation and a local excision or should I go to surgery? There's this other group of large tumors where you have already decided to give chemo radiation and you can call that opportunistic organ preservation or opportunistic watch and wait. Um, because if they show a complete response, if you go and look for it, you could just just not do surgery but watch them. And of course, the one who has popularized this is Angelita Habergama from Brazil in 2004. This is her paper. 2004. I remember reading it and I didn't believe it. So did you believe it when it came out in 2004? I didn't believe it, but then I, I had a patient who came and, and patients forced us to do this. And we, so there's been more reports. Some of these are ours. So also in 2004, I had this patient with this distal tumor. It's a stage T3 and 0. So he got chemo radiation and an APR was planned. But then it disappeared and the patient refused surgery. And I said to him, well, you know, if these crazy Brazilians are not operating, um, I am happy to watch you, but it's, it's not my risk, it's you are, you are taking the risk. And he said, well, I'm happy to talk to the doctor taking the risk. So this is what it looked like on the endoscopy. It's, it's beautiful. The tumor has completely gone. So 2004, I have discharged this patient years ago. So he did very well. And he actually designed our protocol rather than taking everyone straight to surgery. We said, hey, let's, let's take a look at eight weeks, not four weeks, but wait a little longer. And if they show a clinical complete response, we can say to the patient, well, we can take you to surgery, but it might well be that there's nothing there. Would you like us to do that or would you like to wait? And almost all patients including doctors who, who get rectal cancer, they say, well, let's, let's wait a little bit. Um, initially, we thought that MRI was going to be the thing to, to detect complete responses. But later, we found out that actually the finger and the scope are, are even better tools. Of course, you cannot look at the lymph nodes. You need MRI for that. You can add diffusion. You can add little things. So these are the rock curves um, of the techniques for com detecting complete response. Blue is MRI. Green is MRI with diffusion. The black one is just the finger and the endoscope. And if you add everything up, you have a rock curve of 90%. Of course, the critical surgeon is asking, are you really, really sure there's nothing there? No, that doesn't exist in medicine. Um, but it's a change of concept. So we accept that we are not 100% accurate. And you can do that if you detect the persistence of tumor early and if you can treat it very well. And we didn't call it local recurrence because that is a bad thing after um, TME surgery. We called it regrowth because it appeared not to be problematic to treat it. So you have to follow these patients and we do that again with the finger, the scope and the MRI. And we do that every three to four months in the first year, the second year. This is the schedule we started off with, I think in year three or four we could do less MRIs because I'll show you where we saw the 
So this is a typical luminal regrowth, we call it. At three months, nice car. At 15 months, you see this little thing appearing. You can still do your TME surgery. Here's one patient. It's not working. No. There is one with the lymph nodes that started growing again. You can still do your TME surgery. And you note that it, it doesn't explode the regrowth. So you have time to detect them. Now, Angelita Habergama said these are the typical clinical complete responses. If it all disappears, you see this white scar with red teleangiectasis, and that is true. If you see this, the chances of a complete response are very high. But if you put your scope in there at six or eight weeks, it doesn't always look like that. Can I have the next slide? Because these are 16 different patients that, in my opinion, didn't look like a clinical complete response, and I did a TME resection, and they were all complete responders. Some of them ended up with a stoma, some of them probably had an anastomotic leak in ICU, and there was, there was no tumor there. So we thought, well, maybe we should look at it differently, and if you see, if you see this at eight weeks, it's a very good response. Why not wait a little longer and then either it becomes, it heals like this or it starts growing a little bit and then you do your resection. So rather than, can you, yes, so rather we, ad we adjusted this and having to decide at eight weeks, next slide please. I'm sorry, you should change the battery. Yes, so we added another interval, so if we're not sure, but it's a very good response, why not wait a little longer? Next slide. So we have been doing this in the Netherlands. Um, and, and we have now more than 500 patients in the Netherlands. Um, that have been, yeah. So where where should I aim? Okay. I have to go back. So the majority. So Dutch surgeons started working together and they sent patients to me and then they started doing it themselves. The majority are larger tumors, as you can see, and plus distal tumors. So in 332 patients, we, they were not operated and they were followed. They entered the program. And as you see, there were quite a number of regrowths there, but I'll come back to it. But please note, relatively few patients have metastasis and they have a very good survival. You can see the same in the group who got a local excision. And of course, that is because patients who have a good response are a biologically favorable group. So radiotherapy, good response to radiotherapy selects out biologically uh, favorable patients. Of course, if you do watch and wait, you have to pre be prepared uh, having, uh, to treat your regrowths there. So there's quite a number of luminal regrowths, not so many nodal regrowths we were afraid of, so stressing the importance of, of the follow-up with your finger and the endoscope. So how So these are 69 patients with the regrowth. You see they occur within the first two years, so this is when you should be most surveying these patients. The majority luminal, it's 20%, it's one in five. You have to tell the patients, and they were all treatable with standard TME resection or a local excision, or a couple of cases we had to do a larger resection and we have 100% pelvic 
pelvic control so far. The survival of these patients is very good. That's because their biology is very good. And of the patients who died, the majority died of unrelated causes. They have metastasis, but it's very few. Oh. The importance of follow-up. This is one patient um, who moved away to another part of the country, he skipped one appointment and then he got one bad MRI and then you see a presacral nodal recurrence was, was quite huge. We were able to treat this patient but, but if you don't organize your follow-up very well or if your patient is not compliant to follow-up you can run into these problems. The majority of regrowths are like this. On the left side you see the primary tumor, nice response. This is where you do a biopsy and you find adenocarcinoma. Of course, you can do your APR. You maybe can do even a very low anastomosis or a local excision. So you don't burn your bridges. Um, so with many centers in the, across the world who are doing this, we pulled our results. There are also Russian patients, Russian centers in there. And in our international watch and wait registry, we basically see the same thing. The survival is very good. The local regrowth rate here is 24%, a little higher than in the Dutch series. And the majority are endoluminally, so you, have, you can detect them. So the endoscope is the most important part of your follow-up. Um, of course, you want to retain the rectum, but you want it to function too. So we were checking on the quality of life. And yes, they are better than if you do a low anterior resection. But after radiotherapy alone and no surgery, you still have large problems. One out of three patients has some reports, some change in bowel habit. The majority report clustering and fecal urgency. But they say, I'm able to cope with that. I give myself a little enema in the morning and that's fine. Or I have to be a little quick when I go, but I'm happy. I'd rather have this than a stoma. So yes, it works in maintaining the quality of life. Of course, in locally advanced rectal cancer, this is only in 10, 15, 20% of patients. So how can we improve the response rates? We know that by giving more systemic therapy, yes, you will see more responses. There have been trials showing that. The French show that with adding Folfoxiri, you have much more responses. Um, we are working with immunotherapy to increase the responses. Um, what definitely is going to work is adding a higher dose of radiotherapy. And you can do that by an external boost, or we have also the internal contact radiotherapy machine. If you give a higher dose on the right side, you can see the dose response curve. You will see more responders. But with radiotherapy, with chemotherapy, with everything you do, you're going to see its own complications. So if you start increasing the dose of radiotherapy, as we did, you're going to see these kind of complications. And at some point, you're going to realize, hey, now, we were doing this to avoid complications of surgery, but it makes no sense to change them for complications of radiotherapy. So at a certain point, I believe um, surgery will be the standard for a lot of patients. What is going to change the field is if we were able to predict the response. I don't think there's going to be a single predictive factor of this patient is going to have a complete response. Um, but you can make models with clinical uh, features, biomarkers from biopsy, and we are working on radiomics. So if you have a patient with a small tumor, and I'm trying to get to the screen, yes, there it is. Um, it's very distally located, it's not huge. If you want to save the sphincter or some function in this patient, and if the 
predictive model would say you have a 70% chance of a complete response to chemo radiation, I would go for chemo radiation. If the patient had a 15% chance of a complete response to chemo radiation, I think I would go straight for surgery and do a low coloanal anastomosis. So this is what we should work for. So I'd like to conclude, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, that organ preservation is feasible. In large tumors, we see it happening by accident in 15%. And the big challenge, especially if you start screening, is to, to how should we take this further to smaller tumors? Because they have a higher response rate. Um, the oncological outcome seems good. We have no level one data, but we have reasonable cohort data that suggests that you don't run a risk in waiting a little longer, but you need to organize your, your selection and follow up. And as I said, we have an increasing opportunity for organ preservation with the screening program and with the increased response rates. And above all, the patients are really asking for it. Thank you very much. Uh